In this video, let's create our first shader graph. The shader editor, also called the shader graph window, enables you to build shaders visually using a network of nodes and connections. So here's an example of a typical shader graph. It's a web-like structure that replaces the handwritten code traditionally used to make shaders. But the objective is the same as if we were writing this in CG or HLSL. We want to create a mini program to talk to the GPU and change how the material renders on screen. Now, most of the shader editor or shader graph window, however you want to call it, is mostly just gray, empty workspace. We'll build the shader's various nodes in here connected by lines. And just as the name shader graph implies, it's a graph, as you would see in mathematics. Each one of these nodes can contain an asset or an operation. String enough of these nodes together with some clever logic, and you can make a shader out of this. And naturally, because we do it in graph form, we call this a shader graph. Each shader graph terminates at a single node that serves as the shader's output or master node. Now we're using a PBR graph, so you'll always see one node marked PBR master in this type of graph. The shader editor, in addition to showing the graph itself, has a couple of floating UI elements. There is a little palette off to the side, and that's the blackboard. Basically, it shows publicly exposed properties. We'll use this to communicate with the Unity editor and allow the shader to get data in and out of the inspector. And over here in another floating UI, we have the master preview, which demos your shader on top of a primitive or a custom mesh. The graph framework gives you instant feedback as you apply changes, making shader creation really interactive. Of course, this is a finished shader or one that's pretty far along. When you open up a brand new shader graph, like our highlight shader that we just created, you'll get something a bit more plain like this. Again, we have the same UI elements in the shader editor. We have the blackboard, the master preview, and we start with a single PBR master node. The shader graph window itself works like any other window in Unity. You can dock it in the main Unity layout or just keep it floating on top. That's up to you. I'm going to park mine right here above the game view. Now at any time, you can always maximize it from the context menu above the tab. Or you could use the shift spacebar hotkey to toggle the currently focused window in and out of maximize. And that's really handy when you want to jump back and forth and edit the shader graph and then go see the multiple view layout to see the results of the shader in your scene. Now back in the shader editor, we always start with one node that is labeled PBR master, and that is the master node or the output node. We're going to add more nodes into our graph and then they'll funnel into this node, modifying the final result of the shader. You can use the middle mouse button to navigate the workspace and basically drag and pan the view around. Now we only have one node right now and this makes more sense in a complete graph. So let me just demonstrate this in the other shader graph that I showed you earlier, but just try to follow along. And again, use the middle mouse button to pan the workspace and use the middle mouse wheel to zoom in and out. If you lose your place in the work area, you can always press the A hotkey to frame all the nodes on screen, or you could use the F hotkey to frame any specific part of the graph that's selected. So you can select one node or several nodes, press F, and then it will frame up in the work area. This will make more sense when we start creating more nodes. So don't worry, you'll get tons of practice using these shortcuts to navigate our shader graph after it's more filled out. Now you'll notice that the blackboard and the preview window UI elements should stay put as you adjust the workspace. They aren't affected, but you can position those as well on screen by dragging their title bars around. Now many of the nodes have a little caret to hide or unhide the preview thumbnail if they have one. So just click on that little caret to toggle the preview on or off. Okay, I'll jump back to our bare bones highlight shader graph. You should notice that the PBR master node has a number of small circular icons off to the side. These circles are called ports and they represent how you can connect the nodes together. Each port usually references some type of input or output that the node can accept. Because this is the master node, the ports represent many of the final properties that we'll see on the final material. 
and a lot of the names should look familiar to you. Now there are a few extra ones like position and alpha clip threshold, but the rest of these you should know just from working with materials. Albedo, normal, emission, metallic, smoothness, occlusion, and alpha, all these correspond to what you see in the inspector whenever you're looking at a material using the standard shader. As we modify our shader graph, we'll change these properties procedurally and affect how the material renders on screen. Now the simplest shader we can make is just one that shows a solid color. So let's make a shader that shows one solid color. If you click on the color chip next to the albedo port, you'll change the base color of the shader. I can click that and change it to a nice shade of blue, for example. If you unmaximize the window to see the results, you'll notice that nothing happens just yet. The material preview window shows up as a gray ball in the inspector. And that's because changes need to be saved to the shader graph before they can take an effect. So let me click Save Asset in the upper left hand corner of the shader editor. And now the blue color will actually affect the shader. The shader tells the material to only show the color blue that I selected. And that's what we're going to see in the preview window. If you sign our hard hat highlight material to the safety hat object, you'll see that the hard hat turns blue in our scene. And that's the simplest shader that we can create. It's not very useful unless you need to color your game objects this specific shade of blue. And if you look in the inspector, you'll see that we don't have any input into what the shader and material are doing to the hard hat game object at all. We can't really control the color or really anything at all for the material or the shader. At minimum, it would be useful to allow the user to decide what color to render the geometry. And here is where we can actually use our blackboard. All right, let's maximize our shader editor window again. Instead of hard coding the input color of the albedo property, we want to let the user pick the color. So let's create our first node outside of the PBR master node. The UI allows you to create nodes in several different ways. And the first way is just to right click over the workspace and select create node. You'll see the interface change this create node dialog box. And you can also bring up this dialog with one less mouse click. Just tap on the spacebar hotkey when you're over the work area of the shader editor and you'll get this same create node dialog. Now there are dozens of nodes available in here organized into little groups. It will take you a little while to get used to where everything is. So I encourage you to take a moment and just explore this dialog box. Familiarize yourself with the nodes in here and start learning where to find them. Now for your first mini challenge, see if you can locate a node that can allow you to generate a specific color. Go ahead and try to find that. There are normally a couple of ways to locate each node in here. So pause playback and then resume when you think you found it. Welcome back. We just need a node to select a certain color. And once you get used to how the groups are organized in the create node dialog, you'll find it under input basic color. The input nodes allow you to give the shader graph some information as input. In this case, we want to pass in a specific color. If I select color, it drops a color node in the workspace. Feel free to drag that around with the left mouse button. If you created a node by accident or you decide you don't need it, then you can always just right click to delete it. And you can always use the space bar to bring up the create node dialog again. You also always have the option of searching for a node by its name in the filter at the top of this dialog. In my case, I know the node is named color and I could just start typing out color in the filter and it will show you all the relevant nodes filtered by name. So select the color node again and let's drop that into the workspace, position it around here. You can click the color chip to edit the color to whatever you want. Instead of the default black, let's choose a shade of red, for example. Anything other than black or blue will be fine here. Now the only other thing that we can do with this node is switch the mode from default to HDR. We don't need to go into high dynamic range, so let's just keep that at default. Now that I have some color data in this node, I want to send this data to the albedo property of the master node. Now we connect nodes through their ports. Each node has that little circle icon on either the right side for output ports or the left side for input ports. 
and we want to left click and drag the output port of the color node into the albedo input port of the PBR master node. Now once I let go, you'll see the color chip next to the albedo disappear. We've replaced that with this color node. Notice how the PBR master node and the master preview thumbnail both show up with a red material now. But if you go back to the main scene, again, you won't see the results of your shader graph until you save it. So click Save Asset, and now our safety hat object turns red. Of course, we're in the same situation as before. We effectively still have the color hard-coded into the shader graph. And here is where the Blackboard UI element comes into play. We can convert our color node into a property. We can make it public and expose it in the Unity Inspector. Right click over the color node and select convert to property. When we do that, we lose the ability to edit the color node directly. Instead, we get a property called color exposed in the blackboard. So you can open up that little drawer on the left and you can see that the color property has all the data that we could set in the color node before, plus a couple of extra things. We can check whether the property is indeed exposed in the inspector. So we'll leave this checked for now. And we also get a specific ID reference. If you do some scripting and you want to refer to this color property, this is the identifier that you would use with the material get property method. Now below that, we have our color chip and mode, just as we had before. If you click Save Asset and now go back to the main interface, in the inspector, you'll now see the color property that we exposed in the Blackboard. You can edit the color chip in the inspector, and now this shader becomes much more useful. This allows you to select a solid color, whatever color you want, and it will send that to the shader graph to recolor your game object. So understand that this is sort of the hello world of shader writing. The first time you make a shader, you simply color your game object a single solid color, and it's not a complex shader by any stretch of the imagination. But I'm hoping that the workflow using the shader editor is becoming more apparent. We create a series of nodes, pipe that into the PBR master, and then you expose what properties you want to show up in the inspector using the blackboard. And of course, we want to set up more nodes to make for a more interesting shader. So in the next video, let's make our shader graph do more than just show a single flat color.